Good morning. My name is Deborah Hunt, and I'd like to welcome you to Altadena Baptist Church online service. Let us pray together. Lord, thank us for bringing us together today to worship. Even though we are not physically together, the love and faith of our congregation unites us in spirit. Let us pray for those in trouble, sickness, need, or any adversity, especially those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Pray that we will be open to God speaking to our hearts through his word at this time of praise and worship. Pray that we learn and grow in our worship experience. Amen. Your light broke through my night, restored exceeding joy. Your grace fell like the rain and made this desert live. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into Baptist Church continues to be closed for in-person meetings, including our worship services, but we are wide open for the work of the Lord among us. And thank you for doing your part to keep the family together while we're apart physically. One of the things we're doing to keep contact is a telephone tree. And when you get a call from someone, I mean, there's a purpose of sharing information and prayer requests and needs, but the main purpose is to find out how you're doing. And please share your journey of faith, the challenges, your family news, anything with the people who call you. And if you haven't heard from anyone, uh, just let us know. Call either Pastor Connie or myself or the church office and uh, leave a message on the machine. And if there's anything to celebrate, in your family, in your home, during this downtime, please share it with us so we can enjoy it together. 
uh, the worship service is going along well. We're getting good feedback on it, ministering to people. It all depends on uh, you guys continuing to give us parts of the service, especially those who are musicians, singers. We're trying to get as many people involved as possible. And Lauren has a creative way of doing this. I'm sure you've heard from him. Uh, well, let's create. Let's do it. And our lay leaders are monthly. Uh, Roland Wiley finished up a month with us, and now Deborah Hunt will share her gifts and her experience of the Lord with us in our uh, worship services as the lay leader. Each week there are going to be new surprises, and that's good because that's the way God's Holy Spirit is. Good morning, church. Ty the Nature Guy here. Today we're going to share pictures of animals, a whole lot of different kinds of animals, from little bugs to birds to mammals to big, big mammals that we all want to hug. A lot of these animals aren't going to be to everybody's taste. Some people aren't too fond of snakes or salamanders or little things like that. But we have to remember that they all have a place, just like people. Some people may not be our cup of tea, but we all have a place.
Let's think for a moment about our hurting world. We're aware of that awful explosion that took place in Beirut, Lebanon uh, last week, and we're especially aware because we have some friends who are from that area. So I want to give you a report that Jean and Rene Bouchabal, who are from Lebanon, now living in Texas, report that their family members have all survived the effects of the blast some have received minor injuries and there's a great deal of property damage. So continue to pray for them. Sister Suzanne, the Catholic nun who lived among us for several weeks, two years ago, has reported that her family and close relatives all surprised, uh, survived the uh, explosion. Although again, uh, there's a lot of physical damage to property. She still hasn't heard from all of her students or their families, so she would like to have us to continue to pray for them. And let's remember that the whole city of Beirut, Lebanon, is traumatized and needs our prayers. Traveling to another part of the world, Judy and I have been watching the new Netflix documentary report entitled Immigration Nation. Well, it is powerful and it gives us an intimate sense of the pain and security families at our southern border are going through in detention centers where children are often separated from their parents indefinitely with little hope of reunited, of reuniting. And we have needed that reminder. So even though it's heartbreaking, we need to remember this is really close to home. And in mentioning these two places, Lebanon and the southwestern part of the United States, they're just on my horizon because of my immediate awareness. But I'm aware that in many other places in the world, there are people who are suffering in silence because most of the world doesn't know about what they're going through. The Uyghurs in China going through awful, awful suffering and persecution, really. Natural disasters, hunger, there's starvation in many parts of the world because of economic pressures, refugee camps. This is a hurting world. And it's because this is a hurting world that we as Altadena Baptist Church have a missionary support program and we have throughout the history of our church. It's why we pray for personally supported missionaries who are scattered throughout this hurting world to bring a touch of Christ's love and good news of the gospel. <clears throat> Each Sunday, we remember one of these missionary teams in prayer. And today, 
we're going to hear from Barbara and Steve Wilkinson, who were part of the Altina Baptist Church family uh, during the 1980s when he was studying in seminary. And they have given their lives to helping to educate and equip a young generation of spiritual leaders for churches throughout countries in Asia. We have a word from them today to us. Hi, ABC. I am Steve Wilkinson. Along with my wife, Barbara, we were active in ABC during the 1990s when we were students at Fuller Seminary. We were also part of the TLC group that met in the home of Ivory and Marilyn Webster. Many ABCers attended our wedding in 1995 and rejoiced with us when our oldest son, Paul, was born in Pasadena at the Huntington Hospital in 1998. Since then, we have served under Converge since 1997 and spent most of those years in international ministry in the Philippines, doing leadership development as part of a team of Filipinos and missionaries. I serve as a professor of New Testament interpretation at Cebu Graduate School of Theology in Cebu City. Currently, though, face-to-face -face instruction is not permitted in the Philippines, so I'm preparing for the opening of first semester and teaching New Testament survey online, which will be a first for me. I will also mentor a new young instructor who's going to teach Greek in my place. Finally, I also have some doctoral level students that I will mentor in the subject of advanced research methods. Through the partnership ABC has had with us, you have helped to train hundreds of pastoral leaders, Christian school teachers, and cross-cultural missionaries. Most of them are serving somewhere in Asia right now. Barbara has ministered to many on the margins of society in Cebu, such as the deaf and lepers. She also did a lot of work with children when she was director of Christian education at Northview Christian Fellowship. Another door that God opened to her was teaching women in both English language and in Bible. But probably her biggest ministry, beyond those just mentioned, she has homeschooled our two boys, Paul and Timothy, through most of their grades. Please pray for our team of Filipinos and Americans as we continue to work to raise up a generation of Asians that will reach other Asians with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your partnership over these past 20 years, and God bless you, ABC. I was just thinking, preparing for this being a lay leader for the month, what am I going to talk about? I have memories of my grandmother. She always cared for me and my brother and sister growing up. My mom worked two or three jobs as a registered nurse, so she was always trying to support her household. And my grandmother always had her Bible, and inside her Bible she had birth announcements, graduation announcements, baby pictures, anything that was special to her that she would put in this Bible, to the point where it was falling apart. So what would we do for her birthday, for Christmas, we would buy her a new Bible. And she would say thank you, and she would kindly just kind of put the Bible away, and we would never see it, and she would be back using her old same Bible. So it just got me thinking that we find comfort in our routines. We have things that are comfortable to us, things that we use all the time, and that's where we feel comfortable. Now with COVID-19, we're being pushed outside of our comfort zone and out of our routine. But... Things like reading the Bible and having that next to you, being able to open it every day, is something that we can just do every single day and we don't, COVID-19 can't take that away from us. So ABC continues to need your tithes. Offerings during this time all go to the ministries that our church are still ongoing. Let us pray for the offering now. Lord, thank us for these offerings that you have given us today. Please guide us to use them in a way that helps our congregation and for the best of all, for everyone. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Yes. 
songs of, of deliverance Whenever I am afraid I will trust in you I will trust in you Let the weak say I am strong strength of the Lord. I will trust in you. You I will trust in you. Let the heart say the songs I deserve in the strength. Trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. I will trust in you. We'll bow together now for our congregational prayer this Sunday. Our Lord, creator and sustainer of the universe, our Heavenly Father, we pray for the hurting world of needy people. We pray for those in Lebanon that we've talked about and all the stress that is on them. We pray for those in detention camps at our southern border. We pray for those in refugee camps all over the world. And we pray for those in the refugee camp we know as the streets of Pasadena and Altadena, where homeless people sleep in their cars every night. And we pray for these others that we may go days without contacting because we live in a world isolated from so many of the hurts. And we pray for the continuing ministry of Steve and Barbara Wilkinson for the students that they continue to nurture, even through this difficult time where everything has to be done online. We pray that you will give them your continued and renewed anointing, that you will raise up young leaders who are really gifted to meet the challenges of this age. And we're here at Altina Baptist Church raising some wonderful young people by your grace. We pray for our youth focus of this week, and that is our wonderful young brother, Alex Wiley. We pray for him, obviously gifted person, and we all know it and we all want those gifts to be used in a way that brings out the best in him, that makes his family proud, and that glorifies you as his father. So we lift up Alex. We pray that he may consider you his personal friend throughout his life. Bless Roland and Claudia, his parents, and give them your guidance as they make the hard decisions that they have to face in life. We pray for this family, and we pray also for the sick among us. Uh, Santiago Chavez, who is related to Claudia and who has gone through a sickness that put him in the hospital, we thank you that he is now home, but his mother is now caught the same bacterial infection, and we pray that you will bless Christina, lift her up. Be with Dave Bassett as he still goes through tests, looking forward to coming home again. We pray that you'll give him patience and comfort and healing. And for Peter Larson, who has made it home from the hospital, and we pray that you will help him with his restoration, strength, and patience, and thank you for the 
wonderful spiritual gifts you've given to our church and to his family through him and pray that he may continue to have his ear open to what your spirit is teaching him. And for the Baranaga family, we thank you for good progress and a sense of your hand being on the whole family. Lift them up, we pray, Lord. There are many others who are going through struggles physically, emotionally, and those especially who seem isolated and we're not hearing much from, it may be because they're very lonely and very depressed. We pray that you will hold their hands right now. And ultimately, Lord, during these trying times, we want to express the spirit of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray and that they passed on to us using some of our own words. Our Heavenly Father, our Father in heaven, may your name be glorified through our lives here and now. May your kingdom come. May it be just as much in charge here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us what we need today and forgive us for not thanking you for what you gave us yesterday. And Lord, help us to be as forgiving toward others as we are asking you to be toward us. Help us not to fall into the many temptation traps that are all around us and deliver us when we do for everything, our lives, the troubles of this world, all the powers and forces, the universe itself, everything really belongs to you for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I've had several conversations lately where people have wondered out loud whether the strange new world we are living in is a sign that we are entering into the end times and whether Jesus is coming back again soon. Every time I think about Jesus' second coming, I think to myself, it cannot come soon enough. Come, Lord Jesus. And then I have to look up because he's coming from the clouds. When I was a kid, we'd see a strange cloud formation in the sky and we'd wonder if that was Jesus coming. I remember sitting out on lawn chairs, watching and waiting on vacation because we didn't have very much else to do, wondering out loud with my siblings if this was Jesus. I remember praying before having to study for a hard test this would be a good time for you to come, Jesus. That way I wouldn't have to do this hard work that I don't really want to do. And I also once remember when we were going to Disneyland the next day, praying that night in my nightly prayers, please don't come back tonight because I just want one more day so that I can go have fun tomorrow. I was brought up expecting an unexpected return of Jesus Christ, because that's what he promised his disciples, that he would return to take us to himself and that he would judge the living and the dead, as the Nicene Creed says. And when the pressure comes, and when the world is a crazy place or an evil place or a hard place, or when I'm tired of thinking all the work that is ahead of us yet to do, I occasionally think, now would be a good time, Lord. What have you thought about Jesus' second coming? We are living in a pressure cooker, and we are forced into change by a worldwide pandemic and by having to face the long, unbroken legacy of white supremacism and racism in our country, and by a country that is fractured along so many different fault lines. We are living with injustice. We're living with disease and death and fear. We are living with economic hardship. We are living with uncertainty. We are living with social isolation. I've been praying for our re recently graduated high school students because how are they supposed to make decisions about their future? And what about the newly graduated college and university students? I find myself praying for them too. 
there is so very much not to like about 2020. Consequently, we're in a sermon series entitled Shaped Under Pressure. All the outside and inside forces that press upon us shape us. So in our worship time together, we are studying the books in the New Testament that were written during a time of intense persecution and pressure on the newly forming church. These are epistles that were not written by Paul. He wrote during the younger years of the new church, but we are looking instead at writers a little later in the life of the church from Hebrews to Revelations, one book per week. And we want to see the panoramic view of these books, the instructions, the encouragement to a church under pressure. We want to see what is emphasized when life is topsy-turvy. We want to learn one or two principles, receive one or two challenges that will help us to intentionally live our lives, even when they're under pressure, so that when all of this is over, we can say, look at what God was up to in my life. Look at what he was up to in the church. Today, we're looking at 2 Peter. Most people are convinced that the Apostle Peter didn't write this book. It's very different in composition and vocabulary than 1 Peter. It has a highly educated style of Greek in it. And remember that Peter was an uneducated fisherman who spoke Aramaic. Some people think that maybe it was a person who was very close with Peter, someone who spent a lot of time with Peter. A Greek, Hellenistic, Jewish believer wrote it and attributed it to Peter's line of thinking. And that was an acceptable practice in those days. It's short, only three chapters. You can easily read it this afternoon. And if you do, you may find yourself dwelling on chapter one as I often do when I, write, when I read this book. Chapter one is glorious. I'm not gonna tackle it today because Pastor George and I preached a whole series several weeks on chapter one, and that was in September and October of last year. So I won't belabor it, but the governing verses of chapter one are verse three and four. Christ's divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things is precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. And as we read scripture, we realize over and over again that God will not tell us what to do. God will not send us into an unknown future without first equipping us for success. And maybe that's one of the COVID lessons of encouragement that God is teaching us. Even when the challenge of following Jesus is very steep, God has already prepared a way for us and given us from his vast storehouse, the riches and resources that we will need to follow Jesus well. In other words, when we don't follow Jesus well, have here a gem that's on us not on him because he sets us up for victory so as you read chapter one just put all of these gemstones into your pocket all those verses fill your pockets with goodness and riches that God offers you because then you will be called upon to pull it out of your pocket later on and use it also in chapter one is a passage which outlines the apostolic credentials of the writer. This is important because as we turn to chapter two, we read with alarm that false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. This chapter ends with mud and vomit. And I will not show you those things as an object lesson. I was thinking about it and then I realized I'm the only one who's gonna come in contact with those things. So I don't wanna gross myself up, out. 
Some people are a little taken aback with a strong, no punches pulled attack on these false teachers. Some of the words in this chapter are exploitation, deception, condemnation, destruction, slander. These false teachers are like, in verse, verse 12, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct born to be caught and killed. One of my steadfast rules in life is to never ever dehumanize people by likening them to animals, no matter what their behavior is. So that verse took me aback. What have these false teachers done that is so wrong? Well, their lives tell the story. They're greedy and licentious. Now we don't use that last word too much, but since it's used three times in Second Peter, I looked it up and it means immoral, wicked, shameless, lustful. They are ruled by their desires. Verse 10, they indulge their flesh in depraved lust. They despise authority. Verse 14, they have eyes full of adulter adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Verses 17 through 19, they are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the deepest darkness has been reserved. For they speak bombastic nonsense. And with licentious desires of the flesh, they entice people who have just escaped from those who live in error. They promise these people freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For people are slaves to whatever masters them. So a picture begins to form. These are teachers and false prophets who are in their midst. There's not someone from the outside. And you can tell who they are by how they live their lives. They have abandoned themselves to their desires. They are not leading discipled, disciplined lives. And worse, they're counseling people who are fragile under their care that they too can be ruled by their passions instead of their Lord. These people just escaped that kind of lifestyle and the teachers are sending them right back into it. What exactly was the behavior that incensed Peter? What, what exactly was a false teaching? Was it about sex? There are specific allusions to sex and mentions of Sodom and Gomorrah along with adultery. So that would certainly fit. Those words and images were also often used in the Bible as a metaphor for idolatry. So maybe that's in mind. Many of the pagan worship practices of the culture surrounding the first church included having sex with temple prostitutes in worship of that pagan god. So was the adultery in Second Peter against God or was it against one's spouse? What was the exact behavior in view here? Was it some false teaching around money? Is the greed mentioned for money or for power or for both? It's really hard to tell the specifics of the situation which caused the author to write this letter of warning. Certainly the people who first received it would have understood what he was talking about. But for us, the general picture is that false prophecy or false teaching denies discipleship, allows licentiousness, and eventually can be observed in the lifestyle and behaviors of those who teach them. Followed through to its logical conclusion, false teaching, teaching even denies the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Now that's an interesting choice of word there in verse one. It's the Greek word that we get our English despot from. It has the negative connotations of a tyrant. And it's not a word that's used of Jesus elsewhere in the New Testament. It implies the ownership of a slave. It's such a strong word that we start to understand what is so upsetting to Peter. The New Testament writers, including the author here in the first sentence of the book, call themselves slaves of Christ. 
our translations often substitute the word servant instead. But absolute loyalty and obedience to Jesus is so vital in a relationship with Jesus that the word slave is not too strong a word for it. These false teachers are refusing to live as the master commands. Jesus' status as Lord is being questioned. And it's not just that they have strayed slightly off track. They have lost their anchor, and they are in danger of never finding their way back. And God will come to judge them. After a series of biblical examples, Peter concludes in chapter 2, verse 9, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Which leads us to the final chapter of 2 Peter, chapter 3, where the author talks about scoffers. Now, are these the same people in chapter 2, scoffers and false prophets? Or are they a different group altogether? Opinions are divided on this, but the scoffers are scoffing at the doctrine of Jesus' second coming. They also do not believe in judgment. And because they don't believe in judgment, they can live indulging their own lusts, as it says, because they will not have to answer for their sins. So 2 Peter 3, 1 through 7. This now, beloved, is the second letter I'm writing to you. In them I am trying to arouse your sincere intention by reminding you that you should remember the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken through your apostles. First of all, you must understand this, that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and indulging their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since our ancestors died, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Oh, this hits a nerve. It's been 2,000 years since these words were written, and we could say the exact same thing. It's been so long, and nothing has changed. And furthermore, when the pressure of life is intense, we are tempted to think that God doesn't care, that he's not present, that he's not faithful, that his promises are empty. We have been waiting forever have you heard that complaint from an eight, eight-year-old? Like, I've been waiting forever eight years. That's nothing, really. But when we're in trouble, we feel like we've been waiting for God forever, and he does not show up. The early young church thought that Jesus was going to come back before they died. First Peter belabors this point, as Pastor George said last week. And now that first generation, and maybe another generation, had of believers had died off, and Jesus had not returned, as expected. Maybe he wasn't coming. Maybe he wasn't paying so much attention. Maybe he wouldn't notice a little sin here and there. Maybe he wasn't true to his promises. Second Peter assures us that Jesus will indeed come again. But why is he taking so long? And here come some of the beautiful words of promise and truth in 2 Peter, which believers who do not understand God's timing, who do not understand why suffering continues, who are tired of waiting, have clung to for millennia. 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. But do not ignore this fact, this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. God's timing is not our timing. Now, every believer has probably had to learn that the hard way. He is far more patient, 
far, far more patient than you or I am. We are impatient for him to act, to change this thing out, out there. But think on the other hand, think about how you yourself have benefited from God's patience. When I praise God, patience is often a word that comes to mind because I can't learn fast enough to overcome all my imperfect, imperfections, apparently. I had no idea the plethora of character traits that I would have to work on that were wrong with me in my 20s. And I am so grateful that God didn't fully reveal the picture to me of what needed transforming in my life then because it would have been so discouraging. But slowly, ever so slowly, he has directed me to follow him in one area of life and then in another and then in another and there's more to go. God's timing, I don't know if you noticed in those verses, God's timing is tied to his character, specifically to his infinite mercy and love. God wants all to come to repentance. He invites us over and over again to come to himself in repentance. And this would be a good time to take him up on that invitation because Peter goes on to describe the fire of judgment for those who do not. Verse 10 of chapter 3, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in, like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Oh yes, God is paying attention. Verse 11, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will, be melt, will melt with, with fire? But in accordance with this promise, we wait for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So, Jesus' coming plays a big role in Second Peter's teaching. And we are definitely encouraged to wait patiently for our, our Lord and wait some more. I know it's too much waiting for most of us to be comfortable with, but it's interesting what we're not told to do. We're not to give up on this broken world. We're not to disengage from living with discipline. Chapter three, verse 17. You therefore, beloved, since you are forewarned, be aware that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are to double down on leading lives of holiness and godliness, which chapter one reminded us God has already given us the riches from himself to be able to do, we are to grow in grace and knowledge. We are to hold on to our stability. We are to be disciples in our thinking and also in our behavior. In other words, and this is my tagline for this book, we are to live in disciplined freedom. The book of Hebrews was about connecting with God. The book of James was about living out our faith. First Peter was about encountering Christ through suffering, and Second Peter is about living in disciplined freedom. In refuting the false teachers and the scoffers, the author of Second Peter puts up two pictures of freedom. One is probably what every teenager thinks freedom is. Freedom 
is to do what I want when I want. I am the boss of me. But then, Second Peter says, we are bound to our desires, and that leads to slavery, to corruption. Vomit and mud, as I said. The other freedom, true freedom, involves slavery to Jesus as our master. Now, we sure don't like these words. They bring up hooks from our racist past in this country. But my slavery to Jesus results in true freedom. It's giving control to one whose character is mercy and love. It's owing our lives to our Savior who rescued us. Repentance brings great freedom to stand tall, to get rid of that burden of sin, to get rid of that cycle of behavior. The more dis discipled and disciplined we are to our Lord Jesus, the more truly free we are. Don't you want to live in freedom in this pandemic? Let's bow our heads. Our God, we do confess frankly that we struggle with obedience to you, with discipline, with discipleship to you. And we also want to say that we do want to be totally and completely free. And so we come to you as people who need some help in this area. God, please help each one of us to see the direction that you are leading us into, the direction into freedom through discipline and through discipleship, dear Jesus. Help us. If there's one thing that has got its hooks in us, dear God, I pray for freedom from that for your people. I pray repentance, dear God, and recognition of what we have done that has held us back and that has us in bondage, dear God. Pray your Holy Spirit would reveal that to us and that our hearts would repent and return to you and that we could receive that gift of freedom. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. The benediction today is a good one. It's the last verse of 2 Peter. And now grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen.